The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epic in the history of America. As John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail, right after signing the Declaration of Independence. I'm apt to believe, John Adams said, that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance. How? How? By solemn acts of devotion to God. Come on. Isn't that good? These are the guys that wrote and signed the independence. Saw it as a deliverance. They saw it as something spiritual. They saw it as God helping them and rescuing them and setting them free to be who they wanted to be and to be able to worship who they wanted to worship. It ought to be celebrated and commemorated by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, shows and games and sports and guns and bells and bonfires and illuminations. I guess that's fireworks. <laughs> 1776 language for fireworks, maybe. Oh. And from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward and forevermore. I believe our country deserves celebrating, and we need to be patriotic. Uh, I know that God loves other countries. Come on. I mean, America is not the country necessarily that God has set apart. He will bless any nation whose God is the Lord. So on that hand... But on the other hand, he has blessed us. And we have been a nation that has honored God for the most part. And as you'll, I'm sure you will agree, that uh, that's changing. And it's getting less and less God-honoring. Now they curse God and you know, all kinds of things. And it may have been that way for a long time, but it seems to me like it's getting worse. And being a Christian is... is, is it's like being an idiot, honestly, to most of the country. You know, if you name the name of Christ, you're some right-wing bigot, right? And looked down on and criticized and mocked. But I believe with all of my heart that our country is great because it honored God from the beginning. I believe today that we are a Christian nation. I believe that we are a Christian nation. I know there's not uh, Christ-like in, in all the aspects of our country. I know there's ungodliness in all realms in our country. But I believe as far as the foundation of our country, and our country, the principles that it was founded on, and you read all the documents, and it's very evident that our country was founded on Christian principles. For that, we're thankful. But I believe I would be remiss in not uh, saying unless we pray, unless we repent, unless we turn to God, God is not necessarily going to bless us because we live in America. Amen? That's right. And I think that's, that's error to think that, and it, 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 it causes us not to pray, not to do the things that we ought to do. Thinking where we live in America. I mean, it's God's country. And, and, and so God's going to bless it. Not, no. We have to honor God. And we have to turn to him. And we have to repent. And I believe that scripture. The blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And when we leave today, we're going to declare, amen, the lordship of Jesus. I believe we can do that as a church. I believe we can do it as individuals. And uh, we need to do that over our families. We need to do that over our individual lives, first of all. Over our families, over our communities, neighborhoods, communities. I believe our state. And I, over the last couple of years, have been to several meetings in, in Austin and different places. And to hear our congressmen, men and women, state and the United States, 
Stand up and declare just that, that Jesus Christ is Lord over our country. I mean, they're there. You don't hear a lot of that, but I mean, they're there, they stand, they are strong, and they are courageous, and they are standing for this Bible and all that it stands for. And uh, that, that excites me. <clears throat> You may agree with me this morning. <laughs> we have talked uh, several weeks about the Holy Spirit and the wonderful person who He is. And He has feelings. He has a mind. He has a will. Uh, he can be uh, uh, greed. and uh, He can be made happy. The Holy Spirit is a person. We've talked about all the different functions that he, that he does and, and uh, the gifts that he gives and, and how we are better off because Jesus is gone. It just marvels me. I marvel at that when it's to our benefit, Jesus said, that I go away, you know? And so we're better off be- because he went away, because he's going away. He sent the Holy Spirit who lives in us and empowers us and, and, and does the things that we need done in our life. So we've talked about what does it look like to be a spirit-filled Christian? Hmm. And a person that's full of joy, amen? Full of boldness and courageous, full of life. I've, I've got a river of life flowing out of me as a song. I could sing it if I could. Hallelujah. But there's a river of life. There's joy, there's happiness, there's victory, amen? There's a love for God. There's a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. There's a passion for the kingdom of God. There's a hatred for this world. This world meaning what is anti-Christ. There's a hatred for that. There's a, there's a uh, anti, uh, as far as the world is concerned, and what this world represents. And there's a passion and a love for Jesus Christ and a desire to see his kingdom advance. But what does a spirit-filled church look like? Hmm. Well, if we're spirit-filled Christians, we ought to have a spirit-filled church. Amen. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And let's talk about what does a spirit-filled church. Is it crazy? Is it wild? Is it loud? Is it quiet? Ow! What songs kind of songs do they sing? What does a spirit-filled church Look like. What does it do? I think there's con- some confusion about that. And I, I think we need to see. Well, what, what, what should happen? What shouldn't happen? And we're going to take a couple of weeks and talk about that. The Spirit-filled church. What it looks like. What it does. I want to read. I put a little uh, post on Facebook uh, a few days ago. And uh, just thinking my thoughts. Uh, sometimes they get written down. But... Um, Let's see. Hey, what is both sacred and serious, yet loads of fun and full of excitement and joy? I believe church ought to be fun. I mean, I think Jesus had fun. That's not being uh, uh, disrespectful. Some people honestly believe church should not be fun. That you don't smile. Read a thing on, uh, who was it? Irma Bomb, one of them little things in the paper. And uh, she asked a question one time about my little girl keeps turning around smiling at people. What should I, I do? You know? It's like this is something, this is terrible. We're smiling in church. We're happy in church. I believe church ought to be fun and full of joy and excitement. Hallelujah. Don't you, Gloria? Church ought to be long, 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 long. Ah, but it is spontaneous, and yet it's orderly. I believe church ought to be orderly. I believe God is a God of order. I believe confusion and disorder is from the enemy. I believe a spirit-filled church is a church of order, and yet spontaneous. It's lively at times, 
very still at others, and always reverent. Always reverent. It's uplifting and encouraging to everyone who are present. Many contribute, yet no one gets the credit. This is the gathering of the saints. This is the Christians as they gather to worship, to learn, and serve together. I love the church. Be committed to the church. In Luke chapter, or Acts chapter 2, verse 43, Luke writes, Everyone was filled with awe. Luke, I want to read it in this translation. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. So that right there is pretty much how a spirit-filled church ought to look like. Part of it anyway. They devoted themselves. They were, I, I hear that word devoted, church. Steadfastly devoted. It was a commitment. It was a passion. It wasn't something that they did when they felt like it. It wasn't something they did when it was convenient. They steadfastly devoted themselves, committed to learning and being discipled in the things of God. I ask you this morning, is that a commitment on your part? I believe if you're a believer, you're hungry for the Word. The Spirit of God in you. There's a hunger for the things of God. There's a hunger for the teaching of God. That's what a disciple is. A learner. A follower of Jesus. To the teaching and the fellowship. And the breaking of bread and prayer. The fellowship, the communion, the partnership. This is a family atmosphere. Amen. And we are family. See there? Big minds think a lot. And so I, that's important. This is not just a gathering of people. It's a gathering of saints, of Christians. And I believe we're related to each other just as much as I'm related to my, my, my daughter. Uh, Emily, yeah. <laughs> Emily, by blood, we are related in the Spirit. And I believe it's just as different, but it's just as real. We call sometimes, hey, brother, hey, sister. Do you know, do you realize that that is the truth? We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family. And we need to see ourselves as that and uh, treat each other. Everybody say hallelujah, amen. Treat each other as family. Love one another. Being taught, fellowshipping, partnership. Koinia is the word. They break in the bread, having communion together and prayers. Verse 43. All came, listen to this, all, A-W-E, came upon every soul. Now this is the New Testament church. Pentecost had just happened. This is the church in action. Learning together, praying together, breaking bread together, fellowshipping together. And what happened? Every soul stood in awe of what God was doing. Something special was going on. Now that word in King James and many other is fear. Fear came upon them. I believe it has a couple of meanings. But the primary meaning is Fear. It's the word phobia. Yes, it's, it's a reverential fear. I believe there's a fear. There's a healthy fear of God. I do not want to transgress my God. Well, number one, because I love and respect and reverence Him. On the other hand, I fear what God can do to me. Ask, just check, check over there in, in Acts chapter 5. What happened when people lied to the Holy Spirit? Lied to God. They want to be a New Testament church? Oh, well, 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 maybe I'll rethink that thing. No, 
when the presence of God is so strong. People standing in awe. And there's, hey, I'm careful what I'm going to do. Yes, I love and respect him. But this word right here, I looked it up in every Greek dictionary I could find. It says nothing about reverence. Fear of God. Fear came upon them. Dare we transgress the law of God? I think we need some of that in the church. I don't want to, and not fear my fear to approach him. Because I believe the mercy and the grace of God. He's open armed. He'll never reject me. But I do fear. What the Bible says, I, I, it's just coming to me. I don't remember the address. But it says, don't fear man, but fear God, who is able to destroy body and soul in hell. Church, we need an aspect. Dear Lord, I do not want to cross him there's a healthiness in that I don't think it's it's healthy to fear to approach God I think you have a wrong understanding about the father if you're afraid to approach him even if we have sinned, even as we sin even when we mess up because we if we fear him in that sense to approach him then we don't understand his grace I dare to venture it. I may be wrong, and she can correct me. But my daughter respected me as a father. My daughter also feared me as a father. She loved me. But I believe in that same, it's analogous in that relationship because she did not want Didn't want that. That was part of the reason she minded. Really. Consequences. It really is. I know God's a loving guy. You'll never hear me. I mean, he'll, he'll love you. I don't care what you do. You'll, he'll never love you any more than he loves you now. He'll never love you any less. His love is unconditional. His mercy is new every morning. The grace of God is sufficient. And I never fear to approach him even in my worst. And I reverence and respect him, but there also needs a healthy, whew, what God can do. The scripture says, fear God, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. We need some of that, rever that kind of fear in the church. And all mama had to say was, when daddy gets home, fear. But there... And I want to emphasize again, it's not a, a fear to approach. And there's lo great love there. There's great love between Emily and Daddy. But there is a fear there that she did not want to cross. She didn't want to disobey because there was severe consequences. I'm not going to spend that much time on it, but I think it's important. A feeling of fear came over everyone as ama many amazing things and miraculous things happened through the apostles there in verse 43. And all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to everybody as any had need. The New Testament church, caring, giving, sharing, caring, giving, sharing with each other. We try to do that. And everything that I say... We need to do, I say, and we, our, our congregation, can improve in every area. But I, I thank God that we're a loving, giving, sharing church. I thank God that we try to be aware of needs and do, do what we can to, to meet needs in our body. And I will say we've, we've probably cut back a little bit on meeting the needs outside our church body. We still do, and people come in, and we, we help them. But we, our focus is on the, the body of Christ. Our focus is on the house of faith. And we still help a lot of people. And, but we're very prudent about it, try to be very wise, uh, discretionary about it. But uh, I thank God for the generosity of our people and the giving.
Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread. New Testament church, fresh off of Pentecost, what did they do? They worshipped at the house of God. And then they went house to house. They worshipped in people's houses. They met together. It was a family. It was a commitment. It was a partnership together. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Thankful people. Or thankfulness is powerful. You read about the Old Testament and, and how it's one of the reasons that they, many of them were destroyed and didn't get into the promised land. They were not thankful. Specifically, two occasions, the scripture points out, neither were they thankful. They'd get blessed and then they'd serve God a little while, then they'd go back to worshiping some other God or some other idol. They forget God and didn't have thankful hearts. Unthankfulness will cause you to forget God and not worship Him. They were thankful. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. People are getting saved. And I said it before, I believe in a church that's alive, that's spirit-filled. People ought to be getting saved. Great things ought to be happening. I love the where great uh, all fell on them. Many wonderful things, miraculous things, amazing things were being done. I believe it ought to be the norm in our church. I believe it ought to be the norm in every Bible-believing, spirit-filled church. Amen? God ought to be... If we're just doing the natural then we don't need God. If we're just going to see the natural, we don't need God. But I believe because we have God and we can be full of Him, we should see the miraculous and the wonders of God on a regular basis. Not to take it for granted, but it ought to happen. And not just in the, within the four walls of this building. Everywhere we go. Because you carry Him with you. You need to be sensitive and aware. In fact, Peter and John, as we, we see the lame, the beggar man that was healed in chapter 3. They were on the way to worship. They wasn't in the temple yet. And people, where we're going, on the way to where we're going, people's needs are laying out before us. And God wants to use Every single one of us to minister to those needs. Sometimes they're physical. Sometimes they're emotional. And they're not all on the street corner either. They're not all in a beggar looking clothes either. They're in the finest homes in this county and in this city, in this area. They're in the most well manicured lawns in this area. There's hurts great everywhere. Regardless of where they live, if they claim to be a human, there's needs in their life. Sometimes they're hidden. They're very unlikely to come into the church, many of them. That'll preach. But that's why God says you go. And as you go, Jesus saw the need and he had compassion on. God wants us to see the New Testament church, spirit-filled church. They were learning about Jesus. They were loving each other. They were breaking bread and having communion and participation with each other, caring for each other's needs, sharing what they had with each other. People were getting saved. Miracles were happening. Woo! That sounds like a lot of fun to me. <laughs> I believe it ought to be the norm. I believe it. And not, again, not just within the four walls when we come together. We ought to be coming together and celebrating what happened during the week as you prayed for people. As you talked to somebody in the grocery store. As Elizabeth was in Brookshire's the other day. I got to check this man up. Some man was hugging my wife. I heard about it. Charles, I heard about it. He, he, she said, well, he was an old man. I don't know how that makes some of you feel, but I better move on. But some guy she shared with, she listened. All she did was listen. I don't even know the whole story. I just heard her telling a little bit to, to one of the daughters. Evidently, she just listened. Didn't know the man. I don't know if you ever seen the man before. She listened. Just an elderly man. And 
lost his wife five years ago. Just needed a shoulder, uh, an ear. Just needed, just, just needed somebody to listen to him. Because that means I care about you. You see, if we'll just care for people. And you know, I, I think it's so true. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. I mean, I believe in the scriptures. I've memorized all I can. I love the word. I love the word. But they don't necessarily need you to quote the word to them either. In time, that's the only thing that's going to heal. But they just need to listen. Will you listen to me? Will you not judge me? And listen to me? And hear my cry? Boy, and after that, he said something to the effect, hey, I'm not trying to get fresh with you or nothing. But can I hug your neck? Who can't do that? Well, none of us can if we're too busy. If we see it, turn away, there's a beggar. Ooh. But if we're willing, God's going to put people in our path. That's why every time you go to the store, every time you get gas, every time you go in, you need to have your spiritual antennas up. God, how are you going to use me today? Who's going to cross my path today? Who will I have the opportunity to talk to? Who can I listen to today? God, use me today. And you seemingly insignificant, small ways, just like that, changes a person's life. He was hurting, and he left glad. That's being spirit-filled. Next Sunday, we'll talk about the lame beggar man. Everybody says, promise? Gloria? Because there's so many needs out there. And I, I want to be a church. And, I, and for the most part, we are. But my, we can do so much better. I want to be so much better. You know, and, and do some out-of-the-box things. You know, to reach out to people in our community. And, and out-of-the-box things. I, you know, Wednesday night, some were going up Brookshire's and washing windows. That's kind of goofy, you know. But I, I believe you, if you're going to ever want to pray with somebody, you need to meet some people. And you need to reach out to some people. You need to offer to help some people. You need to be a blessing to people. That's just one way. Now, there's other ways. Would y'all pray and ask the Lord, what would he have us do? Not necessarily everybody going to do it, but if you come up with something, out of the, and, and get a team and, and do something. And, and, and go into Brookshire's and taking a can of Windex and, and some paper towels and, and asking some person, hey, would you mind if I helped you? And I just want to be a blessing. And, can I wash your window? And after they pick themselves up off the pavement, literally, because they think, what are you up to? What do you want? What's the catch? They, these, are, these are the things that they say. What, what do you want? And see, that's the problem, I believe, with the church. The the. Perception is the church is here to get something. That's not right. That's why we need to go out these doors and be givers and be doers of the word and, and, and do what we can to be a blessing to people and give. Because that, that perception, what do you want? Oh, we just want to help you. But I know, but what are you doing this for? And they won't, they won't, like it's hard to even convince them that, and some of them insist, well, here's $5. And, and we've taken it a few because they literally drop it or, you know, throw it out a window or something. And I'm not going to leave it on the pavement. And so we give it to the youth fund or something. But it's just, a, we've got to do what Peter did and expose ourselves to other people. And be in situations 
in the store, everywhere we go. This relationship with Jesus is what I'm talking about. Where you're always on duty. <laughs> you're always a servant of the Lord. And we, this Sunday thing has got to, you know, that, that's a problem to where, oh, we serve the Lord on Sunday. You know, we come and worship Him by and large, and, and let's come and celebrate the good things, the wonderful things God did, the miracles that God did during the week because we were submissive to Him and heard Him and obeyed Him. Amen? He loves it. I don't care if y'all do or not. Acts 3.10 and 4.30, real quick. And we are going to talk about the beggar man. And, and it's a good illustration of healing and, 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 and what the church gives, what the church does. But in chapter 3, verse 10, after it was all over, they were filled. They recognized him as he went into the temple. What was he doing? He was leaping and walking and praising God. Hallelujah. Well, somebody said, if God delivered me, I'd be happy too. Well, where is it? There it is. I say, I hear it. See? And we ought to be examples. Having been set free from our sin. Having been delivered. And I know everybody has to be loud and boisterous and I know they're different personalities, and, and we don't put people in a box and say, you got to worship just like this, and you got to dance the Holy Ghost shuffle and, and do this. and We don't do that. But don't tell me the believer don't have joy. Now, you may express it differently, <laughs> but joy is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? And so it's going to be there in different ways. But uh, I love this passage here. They recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. You see, the way to witness is not necessarily to get your four spiritual laws out and go out and say, let me tell you what God will do. The best way to witness the pattern in the Bible is, hey, they see what God is doing. They see what God has done. And you explain. Well, let me tell you. So Peter commenced to explain, and 5,000 people got saved. Come on. Hallelujah. People will start getting saved when you start doing miracles. Woo! When you begin to reach out and touch somebody's life, when you say, God, I will obey you today. I'll go be a witness. I'll go share the love of God. I'll go listen to somebody. And you'll touch somebody's life. Then you can explain, well, let me tell you what God's done in my life. Let me tell you what God has done right here in this situation. You see, they see the wonders, the miracles, the amazing things that God's done. Wow. They were in awe. They were marveled. I believe a New Testament, people are going to be marveled at what God is doing in our midst. We claim to be spirit-filled people in a spirit-filled church. Number one, we're going to see souls saved. Amen? There's going to be miracles happening. Of course, that is a miracle. People getting saved and set free, that's a miracle. Absolutely. Your brother getting saved, that's a miracle. That's a supernatural activity. But God wants us. I believe we ought to experience the supernatural on a regular basis. The supernatural ought to be the natural. Or it ought to be the norm. Maybe not the natural, but it's supernatural. But it's the norm. Woo! Because of who God is in our life. And when he begins, we allow him to work his miraculous power through us. Because the Bible says we have, uh, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through him we can be partakers of his divine nature. You're not just a mere man, a woman. You got the God Almighty living in you, the Spirit of the living God. The very nature of God lives in you. You can, you can make a difference. 
You can touch people's lives. You can look at them. You can talk to them. You can listen to them. You can pat them on the back. Different people have different things. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't all operate the same way. But God wants to use every one of us. Stand with me this morning or I'll just keep preaching. All right, if you're sitting down, I'm going to just keep. Riding, jumping up and down. Uh-huh. Nah, I love giving a hard time. Hey, church. I want all my heart. Listen to me. To be God honoring, God fearing church family. We're loving. We're serving God together. We're learning together. We're, we're participating together. We're family. We're family. It's not just something we do on Sunday morning. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And do our little thing. And go about our week. No, no, no. no. See us as in relationship with each other. And, a, and an opportunity to serve a God needy needs all over us. community. Yes, the people lying there, the needs are obvious, but there's thousands of other needs that are not so obvious, but they're just as great. Amen. People you work with every day, people you live near every day, all over, everywhere, people are hurting. Lives are hurting, financially, marriage, people are in despair, people are guilt ridden and condemned. They need the love of God. The only way they're going to get it is through the people. Amen. Amen. Lift your hands. Lord Jesus, we worship you. But God, we don't want to just, as one person said, stand on the promises, but just stand on the premises. We want to go out and be a blessing. God, I pray that you give us supernatural ways, Lord, to reach you, to help you. Out of the box thing, Lord. I'd be willing to do things different for the sake of the kingdom. Never compromise on who you are and what we believe. God, just doing things, new ways. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to us, your people. God, I pray we'd be obedient to you. Let me ask you if there's anybody here that convicted by the Spirit of God to give your life to Christ today. To surrender your life to Jesus. Convicted you of, of that need today. Something you need, you know you need to do. And that is become a follower of Jesus. Make a commitment to Jesus Christ. To love him and serve him. To change the direction of your life and follow Jesus. Is the one here today. Pastor, I, I want to make that decision. Amen. Now, Kathy, come on up here. Miss Elizabeth, please talk to Kathy and pray the through this morning. Anybody else? I know what God wants me to do and I'm going to have the courage to come to this altar and make it Decision, do what Jesus wants me to do. Just pray. the miraculous Lord. thank you for the amazing thank you for the wonder Lord, that you're going to perform you will perform God I pray that we'll just be the vessel willing obedient vessel everywhere we go this week and everything that we do help us to see 
through your eyes. Receive the needs. And use what you've given us to meet that need. Thank you for your spirit that enables us, anoints us, equips us to do great things. Bless me. Lord, we pray for our country today. We do that just, just everybody right now. Oh, God. We lift up America. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of the Lord. God, we thank you that we are a rich nation. And yet, with those blessings, with that richness, with those privileges, comes even a greater responsibility. God, that we steward what you've given us. God, that we be thankful, grateful, not take for granted the freedom that we enjoy. The blessings that we have. Oh God. Oh God. All the lives that's been sacrificed for this freedom, God. For both men and women who've given their lives so that we can be independent. So that we can worship you and enjoy the freedom that we do. Fill our hearts, God, with thanksgiving. Lord, let us be ever mindful. We must serve the Lord. That we must love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Love others as ourselves. Thank you for our neighbor. Oh, what a blessing that we enjoy. What a blessing. Oh, what freedom that we're blessed with. God, we thank you for America. God, I pray that we will be benevolent. God, give us wisdom to all of our leaders. We will not be selfish. We'll be giving. I pray the churches will rise up and do their part. Yes. Churches. It's a shame the government does so much of what the church needs to do or should do. We relegate. Oh God, give us a heart for the needy, for the poor. Oh God. We give you thanks for America, for our freedom. <coughs> we ask for your continued blessing as we love and obey you. We thank you. Continue to guide our leaders in our country. That we will follow you. That you indeed be the God of this nation. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you.